Hello, my name is Andrew Hager. I earned my degree in business management from the University of North Carolina at Asheville in May of 1992. My additional courses of study included computer science and economics. Subsequent to graduation, I spent decades in careers across numerous industries connected by a common thread, a dependence on accounting. Though not a certified public accountant, I learned early on Accountancy skills enabled business owners to expand and increase profitability faster than those who held little to no accounting knowledge. This holds especially true for general contractors. I also was a licensed general contractor and managed the books for a reputable, high-end custom home builder. I spent over a decade as a consumer and commercial banking executive and lender. I reviewed thousands of business plans and dissected financial statements to identify who was best qualified for loans. The bottom line is this. Contractors need to be well-versed in accounting to succeed. That's why I'm here. Let's get started. It's no secret that the subject of accounting is notorious for being some of the least favorite to individuals, business owners, and contractors. As true as that may be, make no mistake that this continued belief will impact your bottom line going forward in some way, shape, or form. Today's training is designed to be a catalyst of change for you and your business. You will gain insight and understanding that can be immediately put to work after completing this training. My goal is to give you relevant information that will support your contracting business in these uncertain economic times. Together, we will lay the foundation from which you can build your dream business quick overview of this course follows. Module 1 covers two topics. Topic 1 discusses general accounting terminology, while Topic 2 explains the balance sheet. Module 2 covers three topics. Topic 1 discusses credit decisions. Topic 2 explains different forms of credit. And Topic 3 covers finance charges and fees. Here are some general helpful hints so that you can get the most of today's training. Key definitions and concepts may be highlighted, underlined, or boldened. All slides will be numbered with a 1 or 2 in the heading section on the right-hand side to let you know which topic you are currently in. The order of information in Topic 1. Accounting terms will be presented in alphabetical order. The terms discussed are highly relevant for general contractors. The flow of information will be as follows. First, we will present the terms to you. Secondly, we'll group or associate the terms on a balance sheet. Thirdly, we'll review the terms again as we create a sample balance sheet from start to finish. And we will critique and comment on that balance sheet from the standpoint of a former banker and lender's perspective. You'll have a sharpened skill set that can be applied immediately in real-world applications. The accounting period refers to the predetermined time frame a company uses to balance its books and prepare financial statements. Once this period is determined, it is usually consistent year after year. It is the basis of calculating your business income and expenses to determine your profit and loss and consequently any tax liability. Most businesses operate on a calendar year basis from January 1 to December 31 in the same year. In other words, the 360-day period is the actual calendar year. If a business elects, say, June 1st to May 31st the following year, they have elected a fiscal year accounting period. Fiscal periods can be intervals less than one year, such as quarterly or semi-annually. Accounts payable, or AP, refers to an expense or expenses that have occurred but have not been paid. An example of an account payable would be if XYZ Concrete Finishing Company is hired June 3rd by you to frame up, prep, and pour the garage slab on your project. The work is completed June 17th. A bill arrives at your office on June 20th and you include it on your draw request to the homeowner. Because the work is completed and has not been paid for, it must show on the books as an accounts payable. Think of the accounts payable as a system of checks and balances for your books. For example, if you have work completed, it's added value to your project, but that's not done for free. Essentially, the accounts payable logs the expense so that your assets are not overstated and liabilities are understated. Accounts receivable, or AR, refers to revenue you have created 
but have not been paid for. Technically speaking, an accounts receivable is the opposite of an accounts payable. XYZ Concrete Finishing Company has the work as an account receivable when he bills the contractor. His bill covers his labor, materials, and some profit. The contractor shows that on his books as an account payable that becomes an accounts receivable to him when he bills the client or the homeowner. For the contractor, it should be a wash. What came in equals what was billed out. At the end of the day, the homeowner ends up with a product and may have some equity or liability dependent on their financial arrangements in place, if any. An accrued expense refers to an individual expense you have incurred but have not yet paid. It is a subpart of your accounts payable and is represented as a collective of all individual accrued expenses. Therefore, if you only have one accrued expense, your accrued expense equals your accounts payable. However, if you have 12 accrued expenses, their sum equals your account payable. Allocation refers to the setting aside of resources for a specific future use. Operating expenses such as power, internet, and insurance, etc. are assumed to be the cost of doing business and therefore are not allocated expenses. Allocation is a great way to avoid the dependence on emergency credit products such as lines of credit, overdraft protection services, and credit cards. For example, if your business relies on heavy equipment to generate revenue, it would make sense to allocate money each month into a repair fund. Repairs are inevitable, but we don't know when they're going to occur. The best way to prepare for that is to set aside some money each month into a fund so that when the breakdown does occur, you are not borrowing your way out of that certain event. You're going to take the money that's been set aside or allocated and cover the expenses. Allocation can best be accomplished in the following ways. You can schedule systematic or automatic transfers between your accounts with your financial institution or investment brokerage firm. These are the most common ways and can often be set up right on your mobile phone. An asset refers to anything you own that has monetary value. Examples would be cash, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, accounts receivable, real estate, equipment, building materials on hand, notes receivable, etc. The book value refers to the value of an asset on the books, net of any depreciation. That bulldozer and trailer you purchased three years ago for $120,000 is not worth $120,000 three years later. It loses a certain amount of its economic life each year, and the book value incorporates this so that your financial reporting is accurate and reliable. A business entity is an organization or group of individuals assembled for the purpose of generating revenue and hopefully profit. The list of business types on the following screens is provided for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be considered as legal or tax advice in whole or in part. There are tax and or liability considerations associated with each business entity type. Please consult your certified public accountant or attorney for specific guidance with respect to your situation. A sole proprietorship is an individual who owns an unincorporated business by himself or herself. The moment you start selling goods or services, you are a sole proprietor. It is by far the most common form of business entity. It's the easiest to set up, and it gives you 100% control, autonomy, and rights to all profits. There are risks, however. 100% of the liability is yours, too. Failure of debts and the business are 100% on you. A general partnership is an organization owned by two or more individuals who share in all assets, profits, legal liabilities, and financial liabilities associated with operating that business. They are easy to establish, but the partnership does not pay income taxes. The partners must report income on their individual returns. Raising capital weighs on the partners, just not one individual in the general partnership. The risks of general partnership include 100% of the liability is shared among the partners as are failed debts and legal liabilities. A limited partnership is an organization owned by two or more individuals whereby the general partner 
manages the business and bears unlimited financial responsibility for the debts of the business and a limited partner or partners who have limited liability and no management responsibilities. The liability is limited to the amount of the limited partners' contribution. Limited partners enjoy protected investment. All partners benefit from the strength of the general partner and the sum of the limited partners. The risks include loss of autonomy and business uncertainty due to reliance on the general partner. A limited liability company is a business structure that allows the owner or owners protection from liabilities and debts while allowing the income to pass through to the members and member managers of the limited liability company. LLCs require less paperwork to form than other types of business entities. They shield the organizers, the members, and the member managers from the liabilities and debts of the company and is like a blend of a sole proprietorship and a corporation without the detriment of shareholders. The risks include you have to create an organizational document for governance and it may be subject to franchise taxation in several states. A C corporation or a C corp is a business structure where the owners, shareholders, are taxed separately from the C corporation itself. With C corporations there can be an unlimited number of owners. Owners can be different than the management. There are unlimited classes of stock. There may be voting stock, non-voting stock, preferred stock, and convertible stock. The stock is readily transferable to other individuals. C corporations shield the shareholders from certain debts. And C corporations make it easy to raise venture capital because the company can trade ownership in exchange for the financial contribution. The risks include the dilution of the ownership limits autonomy is subject to double taxation. The corporation is taxed and the shareholders are taxed. Bylaws can be very complex and overwhelming and expensive to create and enforce. An S corporation or S corp is a business structure that allows for all corporate income, losses, deductions, and any credits to pass through to the shareholders with respect to their ownership percentages. Owners have limited liability Due to corporate contract breach and or litigation, you may have from 1 to 100 owners maximum and ongoing expenses with respect to taxation and documentation preparation is high, IRS scrutiny is higher, and stock classifications may be limited. The cash flow statement is a financial report that summarizes how well a business generates and maintains cash levels in order to operate and cover normal operating expenses. Think of a cash flow statement as a snapshot of your cash position at a particular moment in time. There are different cash flow reports that can be used. By mastering these types of cash flow statements, you will be able to better determine and plan for the short, intermediate, and long-term cash needs of your business. The free cash flow formula helps you understand what you can afford today. The operating cash flow formula helps you understand the everyday cash needs because it includes irregular purchases. And the forecast cash flow formula helps you plan for cash needs in the future. Calculating the free cash flow model. You take the net income plus depreciation and amortization expense minus the change in working capital minus capital expenditures equals the free cash flow for your business. To calculate the operating cash flow for your business, you simply take the operating income plus depreciation expense minus your tax liability plus the change in your working capital and this equals your operating cash flow. The future cash flow model for your business is calculated by taking your beginning cash level and adding your projected cash inflows and subtracting your projected cash outflows and this equals your future cash flow. A certified public accountant is an individual who has studied for and passed the CPA exam as administered by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. In addition to passing the exam, successful candidates must meet all prerequisite courses of study from an accredited university prior to enrolling for the exam. The CPA exam has four sections, and individuals have 18 months to successfully complete all four of the sections. 
Upon passing, the new CPA candidate must file for licensure with the state in which they will practice. Cost of goods sold, or COGS, refers to costs directly associated to the generation of products to be sold to create revenue, such as inventory and materials, but it does not include general overhead expenses. Credit is a sum received or added to your cash balance. It is listed on the right-hand side of the general ledger accounting column. Examples of credit include income and payroll, refund, interest, cash received, deposits, and any stock dividends that are paid in cash. A debit is just the opposite of a credit. It is a sum owed or withdrawn from your account. Debits are listed on the left-hand side of the general ledger accounting column. Examples of debits include check card purchases, ATM withdrawals, automated clearinghouse or ACH transactions, such as a automatic utility payment, paper checks, and online transfers. Depreciation is the accounting for the loss in value of an asset over time. Generally speaking, large value items, such as heavy equipment, rolling stock, and vehicles are depreciated and things like office equipment and furniture are not. Diversification is the process of reducing overall risk by allocating resources into different types of asset classes. A contractor who is diversified might construct and sell custom homes and speculative homes and small apartment buildings. His eggs are spread over many baskets. On the contrary, a contractor who is undiversified might construct and sell only speculative homes. He may build several and have plenty in inventory at any given time, but he runs the risk that they may not sell or that he may get less for them than he has in them due to the unforeseen deteriorating market conditions. All of his eggs are in one basket. Equity refers to the difference between what something is worth and what is owed on it. For example, if your home is worth $225,000 and you owe $140,000 to the bank, then your equity position is $85,000. If your home is worth $225,000 and you owe nothing to any bank, then your equity position is $225,000. Some thoughts with respect to equity computations. Equity can be instant or delayed depending on how long it takes you to convert that asset into cash. Equity is often overstated because of sentimental value and human nature is to bump it up a little bit. Be advised that your banker and accountant will keep you in line on these figures as they generally know what assets are worth. An expense refers to any outflow of money incurred by the business either directly or indirectly for the purpose of generating revenue. Fixed costs are any costs incurred by a business that remain constant as production levels of the business change. Examples of fixed costs would be rent or mortgage payments, insurance payments, salaries, and property taxes. None of these expenses increase or decrease based on the amount of production created by the business. A general ledger provides a record of every financial transaction that takes place during the operating life of a company. Typically, it's a two-column system with debits on the left-hand side and credits on the right. GAAP are generally accepted accounting principles as set forth by the Financial Accounting Standards Board, or FASB. The main purpose of generally accepted accounting principles is to standardize the definitions, best practices, and theories associated with accounting so that it is more consistent across the board and from company to company. All publicly traded companies must report their financial information using generally accepted accounting principles. Think of the Financial Accounting Standards Board much in the same way as the North Carolina Licensing Boards for General Contractors. They are there to keep the policies and practice consistent. The gross margin is calculated by dividing the gross profit by the revenue for the same accounting period. Gross profit calculates the profitability of a company without consideration of any overhead expenses. Therefore, gross profit equals revenue minus expenses. Interest is the sum paid back in addition to the principal for the use of said principal for a specific period of time at a particular rate. The formula to calculate simple interest is interest equals principal times rate 
times time or simply I equals PRT. Inventory are assets purchased by a company that are used in the production of what they sell. As sales increase, inventory depletes at a faster rate than when sales decrease. A journal entry is the complete record of a financial transaction in the books or register of an operating entity. Proper journal entries include the date of the transaction, the time the transaction was made, the amount that is debited or credited for that transaction, a description of the transaction, and a unique reference number for that transaction if it applies. It is the first step in the accounting process. Liability refers to any unpaid obligation of a company. Liabilities generally fall into one of two categories. Long-term liabilities represent a repayment term in excess of 12 months. Short-term liabilities represent a repayment term in less than 12 months. Liquidity refers to how easily or quickly a business can convert its assets to cash. A contractor who is land rich may be cash poor because real estate isn't particularly liquid. Therefore, if the contractor is land rich, he is said to be illiquid. On the other hand, a contractor who has plentiful stock holdings that can be sold Monday through Friday normal business hours is considered very liquid. Cash can solve more problems than illiquid net worth assets any day of the week. Remember us talking about diversification earlier in the course? Think about the business owner who packs his money away where it can't be easily accessed. Does it give him absolute peace of mind at night? Material. With respect to accounting terminology, it does not refer to any type of wood, concrete, or steel. Material, financially speaking, refers to relevance or the significance of the information. For example, a material expense is one that requires considerable cash to cover as opposed to, say, an incidental expense like an electric bill. Net income is the actual company profit in terms of dollars. Said another way, net income is the revenue less all other expenses. It's also known as the bottom line number, and you want it to be positive as opposed to negative. A positive number indicates that you're making a profit, and a negative number indicates that you're losing money. Revenue is any money earned by a business. On credit with a vendor gives you the ability to obtain goods and services today with payment expected later. This is a normal trade practice among contractors, but if not properly managed, it can land you in a heap of trouble and vulnerable to high fees and interest. Here's what I mean by that. If you have multiple jobs going and you buy all of your lumber and framing from the same location, in any given month, you could have to go to the store three, four, six, eight, ten times to get materials for your jobs. If you keep throwing it on credit, it's real easy to lose track with what your balance is. And before you know it, at the end of the month, you've got a huge sum due, and if you can't afford to pay for it all this month, it rolls to the next month. But now you're paying interest on the cost of those materials in addition to the actual cost of the materials. And your production doesn't stop next month just because you've got high bills this month. Just be real careful when you're managing your expenses. Overhead refers to general expenses, usually office-related, that occur monthly so that you can operate your business. These types of expenses are not directly attributed to any one particular job. That's why they're called general overhead. Examples would include your utilities such as water, power, internet, and telephone. Also included would be your general liability insurance, health insurance, vehicle insurance, payroll expense, and office supplies. These are things that all have to happen for your business to stay in operation. Payroll includes salaries, wages, bonuses, and vacation time. Present value is what something is worth today to someone else. Let's say you want to sell your car in a private party transaction. Does the buyer want to pay less or more than your asking price? We all know the answer to that. But by the same token, you, the seller, want to get as much as possible, right? Therefore, you ask for more than it's actually worth in hopes the buyer doesn't understand present value. Alternatively, the buyer will offer you less than you are asking in hopes that you don't understand present value. In the end, you'll both agree to a number somewhere in between. That number is the 
actual present value. I think of appraised values and tax values as rough estimates that need to be adjusted to reflect current market factors and conditions to make it accurate. For example, if you put two $500,000 houses side by side, one is built by a better builder and the other is built by a so-so builder, even though they're the same square footage in the same area and in close proximity to one another, that doesn't necessarily mean that they should be priced the same. So it's always important to make sure you understand all the details before you conclude the value of something. Continuing our discussion of present value. If given the following parameters, what would you do? If I give you the option to take $100,000 today or $102,000 one year from now, if the knowns are that inflation grows at 3.25% per year, what would you do? Hopefully you would say option A and take the $100,000 today. Why? Number one, you could potentially invest the $100,000 and outpace inflation and you know that $102,000 one year from now will only buy $98,685 worth of goods at that point because inflation erodes the purchasing power of that $102,000. And is that figure less than what you could buy with it today? Absolutely, it sure is, by $1,315. Receipts prove what you paid for or prove that you were paid. A copy of a canceled check is proof you were paid. A sales receipt is proof you bought merchandise. A closing statement is proof you either bought or sold real estate. Return on investment or ROI is the amount of return or profit a business receives in exchange for making a certain investment. For example, if XYZ Construction Company bought a lot for 200000 and incurred $15,000 in closing costs and $3,000 in taxes, their cost basis, or what they have in the investment, is $218,000. One year later, they sold it for $260,000, paid commissions of $26,000, and closing costs of $4,000. What is their ROI? To calculate this, we take the $260,000 sales price, minus the commissions to sell it, and minus the closing costs of 4000 to sell it, and divide that by the initial investment of 218000 and that yields them a 5.504% return on investment. A trial balance is a listing of all accounts in a general ledger that includes all debit and credit amounts that must balance, hence the name trial balance. Variable costs are expenses that change for a business when production levels increase or decrease. Examples of variable costs would be materials such as lumber, concrete, shingles, fuel costs, and utility costs. As production increases or decreases, variable costs tend to move in the same direction as the production levels. Congratulations! We have reached the end of Topic 1. We've learned a bunch of new general accounting terms. Next, we are going to review the terms applicable to balance sheets and we'll construct a sample balance sheet together. Upon completion of that balance sheet, we will dissect it and review the strengths and weaknesses of our balance sheet. What is a balance sheet and why is it important to your business? A balance sheet is synonymous with a statement of financial position or a statement of financial condition for a particular amount of time. A balance sheet is one of the most popular and most commonly used financial statements in existence. Balance sheets are best described as a snapshot of financial condition on a given date. Let's revisit in our minds the general accounting terms found in Topic 1. We're going to focus in particular on the general accounting terms that relate to balance sheets. Those terms are accounts payable, accounts receivable, accrued expense, asset, book value, equity, inventory, and liability. The aforementioned terms by no means represents a complete list of general accounting terms associated with balance sheets. Balance sheets will look slightly different for companies and different industries as expense types and assets and liabilities will vary. Assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. Accounts payable is a collective summary of what you currently owe. If your accounts payable or AP appears high, question them and review them to gain understanding. 
Bankers and accountants will notice these types of things and will question you more than likely. Why not be prepared before the meeting? Some very important questions would be, are you waiting on a draw or a closing? Do you have an unusual amount of activity that caused the spike in accounts payable? Was the work you ordered requested at the end of the month and you didn't have time to collect cash for it? Is your cash position strong enough to cover them? Will you have to have access to a credit line to pay for them or will you have to sell assets to cover their costs? Accounts payable figures will be in the right hand side column of your balance sheet. Accounts receivable is a summary of what is currently owed to you or your business. If your accounts receivable appears high, you need to know this and be prepared to discuss this with your banker or accountant. Some questions that you may want to consider are, does one invoice comprise the majority of your large accounts receivable balance? Did you have an unusual amount of activity that caused a spike in your accounts receivable? Are your jobs over budget causing timely payment issues for your clients? Are market conditions or national conditions affecting your client's ability to pay, such as COVID-19, a death in the family, or a significant unplanned financial event in their lives? Accounts receivable figures will be in the left side column of your balance sheet. Think of an accrued expense as a line item expense in a pool of expenses that we already know to be accounts payable. You may wonder if the accounts payable figure is more relevant than the accrued expenses. Perhaps, but not always. Here's why I say that. Your accounts payable balance may be the same month over month, which represents normalcy to you. What happens if you change vendors to accept lower costs on your goods, but are now expected to pay your bills faster due to their cash flow needs? How can you know exactly where your money is going if you don't break your payables down, especially if you have a lot of payables? You might overlook employee embezzlement and fraud. Always know where your money is going and why. We already know that an asset is essentially anything a business owns that has value. Not all assets are classified as the same, however. Assets generally fall into two categories, current assets or capital assets. It is imperative that you be able to make the distinction between the two and more importantly that you understand how being over or underweighted in either asset category can weaken your financial position without your even knowing it. Current or liquid assets. You may recall that current assets are assets that can be converted to cash easily in less than one year. Cash and cash equivalents are exactly as they suggest. They are liquid. What's in the bank or immediately on the way to the bank, such as a stock sale proceed or a bond liquidation proceed, that's liquid. Always remember that cash is king. Cash is liquid and immediately accessible by ATM, check, debit card, a Zelle transfer, cash, or Venmo. Cash is generally readily accepted anytime and anywhere. No one wants to be without cash. Capital assets, you may recall, the capital assets are assets that are generally less liquid and often are depreciable. Capital assets for a general contractor might include developed lots and land, completed unsold homes and other real estate holdings, dump trucks and heavy equipment. Let's summarize what we know about the assets on a balance sheet. Cash is the most liquid form of asset. Cash equivalents can be the next most liquid form. Accounts receivable can be a mixed blessing, especially if they start to roll versus being paid on time. Notes receivable can be risky too if the borrower defaults on his payments to you. Receivables that don't perform can hurt your financial position immediately. Stocks, bonds, and mutual funds carry market risk and fees including possible taxes upon liquidation. Capital assets are the least liquid form of assets generally are not seen as a primary source of cash to repay immediate obligations. There is an art to learning how to balance your assets. Few would complain about having too much cash on hand, right? But if that's always the case, it's worthy of your attention. Perhaps your friends and neighbors would disagree, but do they know your whole financial picture? Are they running your business? What would your banker or accountant think about you keeping this much cash on hand all the time? It may send a subliminal message that undermines and underscores 
your financial credibility to the financial community in which you operate. The message might be received that this guy is good at making money, but is horrible at managing it. Balance sheets tell a lot more than just a financial position. They help identify trends, both good and bad, that need your attention immediately. If you have $100,000 excess cash in your business checking account and it sits there for a year and pays no interest to you, that means your banker should be kissing your feet. But we all know that they're not going to do that. So what are your choices? First, I would consider how much your bank is making off of you. They can lend out a lot of money with $100,000 on deposit. But do they charge 0% on their loans? No, they do not. They charge 7, 8, 9% interest on their loans. Then why do they pay you so little? That's a question only you can answer. Could you invest some of it in other instruments to potentially increase your return? Could you pay off credit cards and or credit lines with it? Could you pay down your mortgage or pay down or pay off a, an equipment loan or two? Could you buy additional capital assets that might help you generate more revenue? Consult your legal and accounting professionals to help you make the right decisions here. To be clear, it may make sense for your business to keep that much cash on hand. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I want to help you get your own financial wheels turning so you can spot trends and opportunities as well as pitfalls and negative cash flow drains before they become problematic for your business. Moving on to cash equivalents in more detail. Generally speaking, a cash equivalent has to be converted to cash. Action has to be taken by you or someone else to convert that item to cash. For example, borrowers pay off their note payable, your note receivable, and give you cash. A client has to pay an invoice to convert your account receivable to cash. You have to sell stocks and bonds and mutual funds to generate cash. As a prudent business person, you should always ask the following question. How likely or realistic is it that the cash equivalent can actually be converted to cash to meet the needs of my business. Equally important, you should know your financial situation in and out, up and down, and to the point where you can defend it on the spot to any financial person of interest. Other relevant questions, am I depending on one customer to pay an invoice on time? Have I reached out to my customer and relayed the importance of their timely payment to me this month? What if the stock market tanks when I need to sell some stocks, bonds, or mutual funds. Being overweight in cash equivalents is not any better than being overweight in cash. Let's start to drill down on cash and cash equivalents a little further. For example, if a business's cash position is 3500 and their cash equivalents position is $250,000 in a single blue chip stock and $130,000 in accounts receivable means their total cash and cash equivalents is $283,500. Seems strong, right? Perhaps. As a former banker and investment advisor and commercial lender, I have some questions for a businessman that presents that to me. If you had presented that financial statement to me at the bank, I would certainly look to you for clarity and ask some key questions. First, is your cash position normally that low? Did you recently pay off a debt or pay off all your payables? Second, did you recently purchase that stock? Third, have your receivables been accumulating? Are they being paid as agreed? And four, are there any anticipated cash inflows that might make me feel better? During my career, I had many memorable meetings with clients to discuss their balance sheets. I recall two in particular. One was a speculative home builder and the other was a dairy farmer. Let's call them client one and client two respectively. Client one came into my office and put his balance sheet on my desk and said, I have never had this much cash in my account. Isn't that good? Client 2 came in and said, My balance sheet reflects a low cash position right now. I wanted you to know that my attorney said the buyer's deposit on my land sale of 75000 has gone hard and is in his trust account with a closing protection letter from his mortgage lender. Can you guess which client was the farmer and which one was the speculative builder? Client 1 was the speculative builder and client 2 was the farmer. That scenario catches many students off guard and has for years. The more information you have to tell your financial story, the better your story will be received. Famed investor Warren Buffett has a saying I admire. It is, the price is what you pay and the value is what you get. During my career, I was always intrigued by the varied interpretations of book value. When book value is higher than what the market will bear, you are overstating its value. When the book value is lower 
than what the market will bear, you are understating its value. Equity is the difference between what something is worth and what's owed on it. I would challenge you to be realistic on your asset valuations. The debt load is pretty easy to uncover with respect to real estate assets. However, your interpretation of that value of that real estate asset is what will be scrutinized. Your banker and accountant will pay close attention to these numbers. If the tax value of your property is 250000 and you say it's worth 265000 that appears realistic or in the ballpark. If you claim it to be 350000 and I have your tax card that says it's 250000 rest assured I will not take your number on good faith. I will need additional information from you to prove the valuation. Inventory is assets owned that are for sale to customers or assets used to manufacture assets to sell to customers. If you're a builder, your inventory consists of completed or partially completed homes for sale along with any construction materials you have on hand. Liability is what you owe. Liability is generally linked to an asset or assets, which is better than when it's linked to credit card debt and lines of credit. Mortgage liability is tied to real estate. Installment liability is tied to a vehicle or a piece of equipment. Investment expense liability or a margin loan is tied to stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Credit line or credit card expense is tied to revolving credit products. Contingent liabilities are when you are liable for the debt but don't own the asset. While liabilities are common, there is a right way and a wrong way to accumulate liabilities. And just like payables expense, liabilities can paint a not-so-pretty picture if you are over-leveraged or totally mismanaging your debt load. It signals you are a risk and are in trouble. And worse, your lender will see if you're actually trying to hide it. We're now ready to create our sample balance sheet. Three things must be present on the balance sheet header. The name and address of the business, the name of the form, and the date of the balance sheet. Here is the information we have to start with. The company we'll be dealing with today is called Big Time Builders LLC. Their address is 125 Swing of Hammer Lane in Constructionville, North Carolina, 11111. The date of their balance sheet is 12-31-2019. Let's see what their balance sheet header looks like. Please go to Handout 1. As you can see, the balance sheet header is quite simple. The company name, the type of form, and the date of the form are all centered in the top portion of the page. Let's remember that balance sheets are all about assets and liabilities. Assets and liabilities are always classified as either current, which mature in less than 12 months, or they're non-current, they mature in greater than 12 months. Here's the easy way to remember how to calculate the company's total assets. First, list all the assets of the company. Second, assign values of the assets as of the correct date. Third, separate the assets into current and non-current assets. Four, subtotal the assets by category. And five, combine the totals. Now we're going to create the list of Big Time Builder LLC's assets. They have petty cash, real estate, stocks, bank deposits, equipment, accounts receivable, notes receivable, and mutual funds. Next, we must assign values to those assets. Go to handout 2. There you will see a list of all Big Time Builder LLC's assets and their values as of December 31st, 2019. The next step will be to separate the current assets from the non-current assets and total their values for each category. Their separated assets look like this. The current assets consist of petty cash, cash on deposit, accounts receivable, stocks, and mutual funds. Their non-current assets are equipment, real estate, and notes receivable. Please go to your handout 3. We have the balance sheet header completed. We have the assets categorized with asset values. Now all we need to do is total the liabilities for the company. How we total the liabilities for Big Time Builders LLC is very similar to how we total their assets. First, we'll list the liabilities of the company. Second, we'll assign values to the liabilities as of the correct date. Third, we'll separate the liabilities into current and non-current liabilities. Four, we'll subtotal the liabilities by category. And five, we'll combine totals. Here's a list of Big Time Builders LLC's liabilities. They have Equipment Loan 1 for a bulldozer. Equipment Loan 2 for a tractor. Vehicle Loan is Loan 3. They have one credit card. They have a credit line, and they have a real estate mortgage. Next, we must separate them into current and non-current liabilities. Please go to handout 4. There you will see a complete list of 
all of Big Time Builders LLC's liabilities and their amounts as of the date of the balance sheet. The next step is to separate the current liabilities from the non-current liabilities. The current liabilities include the credit card and the line of credit, and the non-current liabilities include Equipment Loan 1, Equipment Loan 2, Vehicle Loan 3, and the Real Estate Mortgage. Please go to Handout 5. There you will see a list of their current liabilities broken down by line items and amounts. You will also see their non-current liabilities broken down by line item and amount. We have the balance sheet header completed. We have the asset section categorized with account values, and we have the liability section categorized with account values. All we have to do now is total the categories and complete the balance sheet. Please go to handout 6. There you will see Big Time Builders LLC's completed balance sheet. The current assets total $123,400. Their non-current assets total $276,000. This brings their total asset position to $399,400. Moving on to their current liabilities, they total $19,500, and their non-current liabilities total $243,800. Therefore, their total liabilities are $263,300. Big Time Builders LLC's net assets are $136,400. We arrived at that figure by taking their total assets of $399,400 and subtracting their total liabilities of $263,300. Let's move on to the talking points about Big Time Builders LLC's balance sheet. Their total current assets of $123,400 is almost dollar for dollar the value of their net assets. This is very strong. However, we don't know if 100% of the accounts receivables are collectible. They have ample cash, ample liquidity, and great diversification. Impressive overall. Next, I would focus on their debts. Let's start with the capital, equipment, and long-term assets and head to the non-current liability section and match up that debt to the capital equipment. You'll notice that the capital equipment total is 51000 and the sum of the three loans against their equipment totals 43800 Therefore, the debt load is 86% of the asset value. Either they put very little down or haven't been paying on the notes long. Let's look at the loans and see what's going on. The discovery of this would cause me to look further into their other debts. Focus on their current liabilities and see if anything appears unusual. By unusual, I mean high revolving balances or high debt balances in general. To calculate this figure, we must subtract the mortgage balance from their total liabilities and we'll see what their other debts are. In this case, taking the $200,000 mortgage from their total debt position of 263300 it leaves 63,300 in non-mortgage related debt. Of their non-mortgage related debts, what percentage of them is revolving? And in this case, it's almost 31%. 19,500 divided by 63,300, that's very high and is also a red flag. In fact, revolving debt typically has the highest interest rates. Did they access those lines of credit to put money down on vehicles? Do the cards offer 0% interest or have other incentives like cash back or airline miles to justify carrying these high balances, at least temporarily? And if so, what is their plan to pay them off? Do they have a plan to pay the balances off? Is it a bulk sum of revenue coming soon? Have the revolving balances been coming down, staying the same, or increasing? What kind of interest rates do they pay on their credit cards and lines of credit? And would it make sense to move some money around and pay the credit cards down or off? My analysis is that Big Time Builders LLC is doing well financially overall. The area of concern is with their revolving debt. Though not problematic at this junction, it is a great teaching moment. It's one thing to be pushing the limits and know it versus pushing the limits and not know it. Being aware of where you are, even if you're not in the best spot, is better than having all the vision in the world and being in the wrong spot. Never stop dissecting financial statements to spot trends that will help you talk intelligently with financial professionals and grow your contracting business. Congratulations! We have now completed the continuing education component, Accounting Essentials for General Contractors. Welcome to Construction Finance for General Contractors Continuing Education course. What to expect today? Learning how to borrow like a pro. Borrowing money is one of life's necessary evils. As with most things, there's a right way and wrong way to do it. We will give you the insight and tools today to help make that distinction and to know when it's appropriate to borrow money. 
Today, we will also discuss what lenders consider to make credit decisions on your behalf. Most borrowers think that a good credit score or fancy business plan will do the trick. Let me assure you that a good credit score can go bad just as quickly as the best business plan can fail. Key to your borrowing success is knowing when to ask, how to ask for the money, and being able to justify you are worth the risk. It's no secret that many loans get issued to those who can't afford them. No one should know this better than you. Some words of wisdom to all borrowers. 1. Know that you can't borrow your way out of financial trouble. 2. No is the most powerful word in the world. Use it. 3. A loan approval doesn't mean you should accept it. 4. Beware of predatory lenders. 5. Beware of discriminatory lenders. 6. Know the correct amount you can borrow. And 7. Never borrow more than is necessary. A predatory lender is an individual or institution who entices you with misleading statements and deliberately sets you up to fail. They play on your situation and emotions to lure you into an expensive, no-win situation. Warning signs of predatory lenders, usurious fees and rates, easy approvals, excessive collateral requirements, and gotcha triggers in the note that end up causing you to default. A discriminatory lender makes credit decisions on factors other than your credit worthiness, such as your age, race, sex, sexual orientation, nationality, religion, or any other factor that has nothing to do with your credit worthiness. Discrimination applies to both approvals and denials on loans. In the second module of today's class, we will discuss three topics. The first one is understanding credit decisions. The second is the different forms of credit. And the third is finance charges and fees. Key definitions and concepts may be highlighted underlined, or boldened. All slides will be numbered with a 1, 2, or 3 in the heading section on the right-hand side to let you know which topic you are in. We'll now start Module 2, Topic 1. The first step in the borrowing process is knowing how much to borrow. You can generally borrow 80% of the value or 80% of the cost, whichever is less. If the cost is 100000 and the appraised value is 140000 if your lender approves a loan to value of 80% on 140, then they could loan you 112,000. Does that make sense? No. You could buy the house and get $12,000 extra with no money down. Your lender would advance 80% of the loan to cost or 80,000, and you would bring the 20,000 down payment to the closing. The 5 Cs of credit is the basis of all credit decisions. They are Character, capacity, capital, collateral, and conditions. This is the biggest part of the credit decision. This is all about you, the borrower. Many other factors will come into play, but never forget you, and only you, pay the loan back. Your character in the credit bureaus. Will you do what's right when the going gets tough, or will you walk away from your financial responsibility? Your past performance is the best indicator of your future behavior. Lenders rely heavily on the three major credit bureaus to help them make credit decisions about you. They are Equifax for the Southeast Region, TransUnion for the Northeast Region, and TRW for the Western Region. On your credit report, there are four key areas that determine your credit score. They are your personal information, your credit history, your credit inquiries, and public information. The personal information will include your name and a significant other, if applicable, your date of birth, your social security number, your address history, and your employer or employers and line of work history. What lenders like to see in your personal information section, in a word, is stability. They like to see tenure in your address of two or more years. They don't like to see bouncing from city to city, state to state, or across the country and tenure in your employment of two plus years with the same employer or more in the same line of work. What lenders like to see in your credit history section is a balanced mix of credit products and years of solid repayment records. You should have one or two major credit cards such as a Visa or MasterCard, American Express or Discover. 
not department store credit cards and gasoline credit cards. You should have two to three installment loans from major banks and or auto dealerships. They are perceived to be better underwriters. If they approved you, you must be credit worthy. And a mortgage on your primary residence. The more historical data in your file, the more reliable the information is. What lenders like to see in your credit history repayment section? Credit account types fall into R for revolving credit and I for installment accounts on credit reports. I1 or R1 translates as paid as agreed. I2 or R2 is 30 days late. I3 or R3, 60 days late. I4, R4, 90 days late. I5 and R5 is a charge off. What lenders like to see in your credit inquiry section? Two to three inquiries per year is optimal. There are two types of credit inquiries, a hard inquiry and a soft inquiry. You may have heard of these as a hard pull and a soft pull. Hard means you apply directly for credit. Soft means one of your creditors did a spot check on your file to see if your financial situation has improved or worsened. Why do lenders do soft credit inquiries? To maintain understanding of your risk to them. Soft pulls allow lenders to see if your credit card balances have spiked or are continually increasing. They can see if you're maxed out on all of your credit cards. They can see if you're making irrational credit purchases. And most importantly, if you're falling behind on payments on a car, a house, an installment loan, or credit card. Lenders can call loans, close revolving lines, and increase rates on you because of information they find in soft pulls. Credit inquiries continue. Guard your social security number like a hawk. Utilities companies do hard pulls. If you frequently move, you guarantee yourself excessive inquiries. Auto dealerships are known for farming out your application to upwards of 10 lenders to get the one that says yes. Yes, that means you could have up to 10 or more hard pulls. Instruct them not to farm out your social security number. Excessive hard credit pulls make you look desperate for credit. The credit bureaus continued. Do not assume your credit report is accurate. Negative information can be corrected, but it takes time and impacts your score for months, even after it has been corrected. It is your responsibility to know what is on your report. Never try to borrow money without knowing what is on your credit report. The credit bureaus continued playing Russian roulette. Don't use the credit bureau's reporting methods to float your cash flow. Even though you have extra time to make your payments without being penalized by the credit bureaus for being late, it can and does cost you. Number one, the interest meter is still running. Number two, late and past due fees are added to your principal balance. And three, you run a greater risk of a reporting mishap that lowers your score. The credit bureaus continued playing payment roulette. Your payment is due on the 12th of each month. Technically, you have until the 11th of the following month to make your payment. In other words, if you pay on the 29th day, you are still current with an I-1 or R-1 status on the credit reports, but you accrue 29 days of additional interest and late fees. The credit bureaus and your credit score. Scores range from 400 on the low side to 900 on the high side. The 400 score is the riskiest to the lender and the 900 score carries the least risk to the lender. If you have a low credit score you can expect higher fees and higher interest rates. If you have a high credit score you can expect lower fees and lower interest rates. Please go to handout 1. There you will see a sample of how a credit report is laid out. First you'll see the credit type, then the account number, then the account open date, the account line amount, the balance on the account, and the payment due. In the following column you'll have the repayment history status, which is a trailing 12-month period. Remember, if you see a credit type R, that's revolving, and a credit type of I, that is installment. The credit bureaus continued the impact of social media. Social media posts can cause loan declines. It is not discrimination if your online posts and pictures 
paint a pattern of excessive risk, such as living above your means, or display risky behavior and activities seen amongst bad company, always partying, traveling, living the lavish lifestyle. Lenders can deny your request, even if you have impeccable credentials. The credit bureaus continued. References. There are two kinds of references. Trade references and personal references. Your trade references will include peers, subcontractors, material suppliers, local building inspectors, and yes, your other banks. Your personal references should include pillars of the industry and community that are well respected and should not be your own family members. Your capacity to repay. Can you prove it? Is your income verifiable? You'll need two years W-2s or two years worth of tax returns. Do you have the down payment? Never ask for 100% financing. It tells your lender you don't have the money to do this transaction. Is your debt to income ratio or cash flow coverage better than it needs to be? And do you have ample liquid reserves? Your capacity to repay the debt to income ratio in more detail. The debt to income or DI ratio is the benchmark lenders use to see if you can afford this transaction. Step 1. List all your verifiable income. Step 2. List all bureau debts and the proposed loan payment. And step 3. Divide the debts by the income. Capacity to repay. How credit cards are figured into the debt to income ratio. Example. John Doe has a $25,000 credit card limit but carries no balance. Can he report zero as his repayment obligation? The answer is no. Lenders tend to subscribe to the worst case scenario theory. As a result, they figure the payment on a maxed out line and use that figure. The hard number is 3% of the outstanding balance. In this case, $750 would be used as his payment on the credit line capacity to repay, what is a good debt-to-income ratio? Every bank establishes their own debt-to-income standard. Typically, they range from 45% to 55%, with the safe target being 50% or less. The lower the debt-to-income ratio, the better. You will have to ask them for this information. They typically don't offer it up. Capacity to repay. The effects of debt to income ratios on approvals, fees, and rates. If your debt to income is too high, then the loan will be declined. If the debt to income is above their normal comfort zone, they will increase the fees and interest rates to compensate for this risk. This costs you dearly over the life of the loan. If the debt to income is in line with their standards, you will pay normal fees and normal interest rates. If the debt to income is much lower than their standards, you may avoid fees altogether and get the best interest rates. Please go to handout 2. We're going to show you how a real world debt to income ratio is calculated. Capacity to repay crunching the debt to income ratio for SJ contractor. Please keep handout 2 in front of you. We observe that his debt to income ratio is 52.47%. Question is, does he have the capacity to repay? I would argue that he most certainly does. He carries no credit card balances. A case could be made by presenting the lender with the last 12 credit card statements showing zero balances each month. The lender could ask for a concession or a reduction in the credit card payment calculation based on that fact. Hint, most lenders will take a debt out of the debt to income ratio if the debt will be paid off within three to six months and you have no late pays on that or any other account. Capacity repay. Cash flow coverage ratio is the debt to income of commercial lending. Calculating the cash flow coverage ratio for commercial lending transaction is more difficult than calculating the debt to income for individual borrowers because corporate tax returns must be dissected or underwritten, non-cash expenses like depreciation and taxes are added back to the available cash flow and debt schedules are required and guarantor analysis is required. A coverage ratio of 1.25x or 1.25 to 1 means that for every dollar of debt service a company has, they have 1.25 times that in net income available to service that debt. 
Capital Requirements Do you have the down payment and cash reserves to handle a new loan? Based on the type of loan you seek, the down payment requirements could vary. Acquiring undeveloped or raw land, you should have at least 30% to 40% of the purchase price in cash to be paid down. Acquiring real property with a building, you might need 20% down or less if a government-backed loan program exists in the market. Acquiring a car may require as little as 5 or 10% down. Capital. Do you have enough adequate reserves? Remember from our first course how we discussed that a high net worth with little liquidity could be detrimental? When borrowing money, this is most certainly the case. Lenders get really nervous when they see less than 6 to 12 months of cash reserves for all debts in liquid form. When asking for a loan approval, make sure you can cash flow the deal and that you have enough cash to put down and plenty of reserves in the bank. Capital. Sources of repayment. Never rely on one and only one source of repayment for your credit request. The more clearly defined sources of repayment you identify, the stronger your deal will be received by your lender. Have at minimum two and at best three sources of repayment. Primary source of repayment. The primary source of repayment should be from your cash flow and should be very strong. On personal credit requests, target a debt to income ratio of less than 50%. On business credit requests, target a cash flow coverage of 1.30 to 1 or better. In your lender's eyes, there can never be too many sources of repayment or too much capital available to repay a loan. Capital, secondary source of repayment. This shows the lender that if things don't go as planned, you have an alternative source to repay the obligation. Selling the asset you acquired or created with this credit should be the last resort and not your backup plan. Asset sales take time, and time is money. The sale could yield less than you owe, and you could deplete your cash reserves in the bank waiting for the asset to sell. An abundance of liquid resources is the optimal choice for the secondary source of repayment. Tertiary sources of repayment. This is a third or fourth line of defense to repay your credit. The more realistic avenues you have to repay a credit, the better. The sale of unrelated property under contract with a significant non-refundable down payment in your attorney's escrow account is acceptable. You expecting to win the lottery is not. Important notes to the capital sources of repayment. Never present your deal as if there's no risk in it. There is, trust me. Your lender knows there is too. Be optimistic, but be realistic. Your credentials should ooze that if the going gets tough, you're the one they want to have their money out to. There are too many of the other types in their loan portfolios already, and many more in line to borrow. Collateral. The security. Collateral is what you pledge to the lender as security for the transaction. It's what the lender holds on to until you fully repay the obligation. If you already own the collateral you're pledging for the transaction, the loan is known as a refinance. If you get cash back, it is known as an equity takeout. If you are lowering your rate or your payments, it's simply a refinance. Collateral, the security. If you acquire the collateral with loan proceeds, it is considered a purchase money transaction. Remember, what you agree to pay for the asset determines what your lender can loan you. If the value of the asset is 200000 and your cost is 100000 your lender will loan 80% of the value or cost, whichever is less. Therefore, this lender will loan 80% of $100,000 or $80,000. This means you will have to bring $20,000 or 20% of the transaction to closing. Collateral. Is all equity immediately recognizable to lenders? The answer is no. If you acquire an undervalued asset, such as a $200,000 property for $100,000, and you put no cash or work into the property, can you turn around and refinance with another lender, do an equity takeout? The answer again is no. Technically, equity has to be created by your efforts, by you spending money and you working, or it has to be earned over a reasonable period of time. 
say two years or more. The lender's credit portfolio is the sum of their outstanding loans. Let's say lender A's portfolio is $500 million. The loans within the portfolio are categorized by loan type. Examples of loan types would be raw land, single family dwellings, speculative homes, condominiums, duplexes, apartment complexes, subdivisions, heavy equipment, vehicles, and unsecured loans. Collateral. Lender collateral pools continued. Lender portfolios may become overweight or concentrated in certain types of loans. This poses several risks to prospective borrowers. We'll discuss those risks momentarily. First, let's determine how a portfolio might be overweight or concentrated. If lender A has $400 million worth of raw land loans in their $500 million portfolio, $400 million out of $500 million, or 80% of their loans are raw land loans. That means 80% of their loans are subject to risks associated with raw land. And that is the pure definition of being overweight or concentrated in certain loan types. Lender Collateral Pools and Concentrated Risk Factors Anytime a loan portfolio becomes overweight in a loan type, even if those loans are the most creditworthy possible, the risks are huge to the lender and prospective borrowers, even if the collateral is desirable real estate. Many borrowers see their transactions as not likely to fail. Lenders expect a portfolio of their transactions to fail because there really isn't such a thing as a totally performing loan portfolio. Collateral. Lender collateral pools and concentrated risk factors continued. What do we know about land loans? Raw land generally takes longer to sell than traditional real estate. Raw land produces no income and has an annual tax bill attached to it. Raw land loans require up to two times the down payment requirements as do other real estate transactions, and raw land loans have higher default rates than real estate loans. Collateral. Assessing concentrated risk factors. When a lender overlays the risk factors on top of their $400 million exposure to those risks, chances are some abrupt changes are about to happen. Regulators can assess the risk of lender portfolios too, and if the risks are elevated, then those risks have to be cured or fixed. Collateral. So how do concentrated portfolios get cured? The lender can elect to stop issuing these types of loans and allow the existing loans to pay out over time, or the banking regulators can issue an order for them to divulge their portfolio of a certain percentage of loans or a specific dollar amount of loans by a certain date. This is a worst-case scenario. Curing portfolios continued. Lenders can issue demand letters to raw land borrowers in their portfolio. Imagine receiving a demand letter via certified mail that states, Your loan has been called. As a result, you have 120 days from the date of this notice to move or pay off this credit, or we will invoke the rights afforded to us in the terms of this loan agreement with you to resolve this issue. Think about the ramifications of that. The ramifications. What if you just closed on your loan and had spent thousands of dollars doing so? What if you have never missed a beat on your payments? What if your loan-to-value ratio is very low and you risk losing your equity? What if you can't refinance because the market is now flooded with borrowers trying to do the same thing as you? What if no other lenders will issue these types of loans? It is your problem, period. Collateral and Understanding Liens A lien encumbers or attaches a debt to a specific property or properties. A lien also encumbers or attaches a debt to a specific vehicle. A lien and a UCC or Uniform Commercial Code filing attaches a debt to a piece of equipment with your lender and the Secretary of State in which your company is registered to operate. Liens are categorized by their rank. A senior lien or primary lien is also known as security in the first position. A junior lien, or secondary lien, is known as security in the second position. This is not the most favorable position for the lender. 
Third liens do exist and are permitted, but typically special circumstances are warranted. Collateral when a real estate loan fails. The lending institution will implement foreclosure proceedings to begin to take ownership of the property. This takes time as an expensive commitment. When they decide to go this route, rarely do they turn back. Do not assume that just because your transaction is secured by real estate or any other collateral that the lender is automatically secured to the good. It costs lenders dearly to foreclose and the elevated risk is there. Collateral. First position lien holders risks during foreclosure. Here are some of the lender's risks. Is the property value what it once was or higher than when the loan was made? Is the property in a state of disrepair? Are prospective buyers in the market able to obtain credit normally today? Are the environmental issues such as contaminations, mold, asbestos identified with the property? Is the real estate market in the dumps? Is access to and from the property still suitable? Ongoing interest and maintenance cost if the property doesn't sell right away? Injury and litigation risk and what if the property doesn't sell? Collateral. How does the second lien holder foreclose? The second lien holder must pay off the first lien unless they are already in the first position. Once in the senior lien position, they can begin the foreclosure process to take ownership of the property. The junior lender has a tough financial decision to make if the senior lender is not also the junior lender. Is it worth throwing good money after bad money? If the junior lien is 50000 and the senior lien is 250000 is it worth shelling out an additional $250,000 to take all the risk of selling the asset to get repaid the $300,000 you're out? Collateral and cross-collateralization. Cross-collateralization occurs when lenders link all collateral to all loans at their institution. The lender draws up the cross-collateralization agreement using specific loan numbers and specific collateral that are being crossed. The borrower must sign a document to make it effective. Once signed, the lender has the right to cure their remedies against you using any of your collateral as means of repayment. Collateral and cross-collateralization. If you have three real estate loans, let's say loan one, loan two, and loan three, on speculative homes with lender A, and they are not cross-collateralized, then each loan is a standalone credit, meaning that the repayment of any other credit is not tied to any of the other loans with that lender. Said another way, if loan one goes bad, then loans two and three are unavailable to be used as additional collateral to cure loan one. Collateral and cross-collateralization continued. If you have three real estate loans, loan one, loan two, and loan three, on speculative homes with lender A and they are cross-collateralized, then each loan is considered to be part of the whole, meaning that if any element of the whole is in default, then the whole is declared to be in default. What if you have $300,000 in equity on a lakefront property crossed in your portfolio? You guessed it your lender could easily pull the trigger on the portfolio to cure the default that could cost you dearly. Loan conditions are extra criteria lenders require to get decline loans to approve status. The approval is conditioned upon certain criteria being met, such as putting more money down, providing extra collateral as an abundance of caution, increasing your credit score to a higher level, increasing your liquid reserves, adding a guarantor or co-borrowers, shortening the term of the loan, which will increase your payment, pay off other debts. Topic 1 is now complete. We will transition into Section 2 and discuss loan types and loan structuring. Loan types. Revolving credit, otherwise known as revolving lines of credit, allow you to access funds at your discretion using the formula your available credit equals your maximum credit line minus your current principal balance 
minus any unpaid interest charges. Revolving lines of credit can be open-ended, meaning that there is no maturity date, or they can be closed-ended, meaning you have to repay all principal and interest on or before the maturity date. Non-revolving credit lines allow you to access or draw only the amount of the line during the term of the loan. You can draw it all up at once or over multiple random draws, however you like. Once the sum of your draws equals the maximum credit line, you have no more availability on the line, even if you pay it down to zero. Loan types revolving lines. Example, you open a $100,000 non-revolving line of credit with your lender and it has a one-year maturity date. In month one you draw $25,000 and your available credit is $75,000. In month two you draw nothing but repay $5,000 on the line. Your available credit remains at $75,000. On non-revolving lines of credit, payments made to the principal balance do not affect your available credit. Another loan type is installment loans. Installment loans are closed-ended loans, meaning you repay all principal and interest over a defined period of time and cannot readvance money on that loan. Interest rates, who determines them? Interest rates are set by the lenders. Most commonly, they are tied to the prime interest rate. The prime interest rate is the rate banks lend money to their most creditworthy borrowers. Prime rates can fluctuate monthly or remain constant for months or years at a time. Interest rates. Fixed rates mean your rate stays constant during the life of the loan. If rates adjust in the market, yours remains where it is. If rates move higher, you win. Therefore, if your rate is prime fixed and the interest rates jump 50 basis points, your rate would remain right where it is. If rates move lower, you actually lose with a fixed rate. If rates drop by 50 basis points, your rate stays where it is and you don't enjoy the decrease in interest rates. Variable rates mean your rates move as interest rates move in the market. Variable rates are priced as follows. They can be priced at prime, which is prime plus zero. They can be priced at prime plus a percentage, such as prime plus a half. And they can also be at prime minus a percentage or prime minus a quarter. Let's put our knowledge of variable interest rates to work. Let's say that prime is currently 6%. If your loan is priced at prime plus zero, then your rate is 6.00%. If your loan is priced at prime plus 1.75, then your new rate is 7.75%. If your new loan is priced at prime minus one, then your new rate is at 5%. Repayment options. Single payment loans. A lender advances you a lump sum for a short period of time that generally requires an almost guaranteed source of repayment. All principal and interest are due on the maturity date that is usually 90 days or less. No interim payments are required, hence the name single payment loan. Common examples of sources of repayment for a single payment loan would be a maturing CD or investment, a confirmed real estate sale, or three, a legal settlement. Loan types. Interest only, non-revolving loan. In this type of loan structure, you pay interest only either monthly, quarterly, or annually based on the outstanding principal balance that is due and payable with interest at maturity. This is a common structure with a horizontal land development loan while the improvements such as utilities and roads are being installed. The bank will establish an amount or a percentage known as a lot release fee that must be paid to the bank as lots sell before the loan matures. This assures the lender's loan balance is secured by adequate collateral. Repayment options for term loans. Term loans are also known as amortizing loan. In a term loan, you, the borrower, agree to make a specified number of payments at a specified interest rate over a period of time. There are three components of the amortized payment. The payment, 
which is the combined principal and interest that you owe each month, the interest component, which is the interest the lender earns each month, and the principal component, what you repay on your loan balance each month. Additional notes on term loans. During a term loan, your interest payment components are steepest near the onset, and your principal component is the least significant. Over time, the interest and principal components invert, and just the opposite is true near the end of the loan. Always try to pay extra on your principal each month. Remember, the interest meter is always running at the very least pay on time. Don't drag it out to the very latest minute. Avoid late fees and extra interest charges that can extend term loans beyond the scheduled maturity date. Repayment Options Balloon Payment Loans A balloon payment is the lump sum principal and interest owed after the initial series of principal and interest payments has expired. Balloon loans protect lenders by amortizing the loan balances or systematically reducing the principal balance each month during the initial period. An example of a balloon payment quote would be 18 months of interest only payments followed by 42 payments of principal and interest based on a 20-year amortization, followed by a balloon payment. Balloon payment loans allow you to have a long-term amortization on a short-term loan. Consider $500,000 borrowed at 4.5% over 5 years. That's a straight amortization. At the end of 5 years, you'll be done with the loan. However, you'll be married to a $9,312.50 payment per month for five years. That same credit structured as a balloon note would look like this. Let's borrow $500,000 at 4.5% over five years based on a 20-year amortization. Your payment drops to $3,162.20 for 60 months, followed by a balloon payment much more affordable. Obviously the trade-off is with a balloon loan you're guaranteed that you're going to have to find another home for that credit at the end of the uh, balloon period. However, having it based on a nice amortization you're almost assured that you'll have enough equity in the property to make financing a breeze. We will now transition to the third and final topic of today's course on rates and yields. Rates and Yields The stated rate is the rate of interest you are charged. The annual percentage rate is the total cost you are charged for borrowing the money. It includes interest paid over the life of the loan plus the following other costs associated with your loan and is expressed as a percentage. It includes points, prepaid interest, loan origination fees, processing fees, document prep fees, attorney fees, and notary fees. Rates and Yields, an example. Please go to handout 3 after you read the following loan scenario. This commercial borrower wanted to pledge the equity in his office building to borrow $200,000 to buy additional land and build a flex space warehouse to lease out. He wanted two years to do so but insisted on paying principal and interest payments to reduce his final mortgage. His credit was above average, the loan to value on his property was 79%, and he had ample equity in the deal and ample liquidity in reserves. Note his pricing. Rates and Yields Another example. Please go to Handout 4 after you read the loan scenario below. This commercial borrower borrowed money to buy land and build a flex space warehouse to lease out upon completion. Construction time is estimated at 14 months. To allow for delays and potential lags in leasing it up, he asked for two years of interest only. Credit was above average. Loan to cost on the land was 75%. Ample equity in the deal and ample liquidity in reserves. Note his pricing. Please go to handout 5 after you read the loan scenario below. This commercial borrower was looking to buy land and build a flex space warehouse to lease out upon completion. 
construction time was estimated at 14 months. To allow for delays and potential lags in leasing it up, he asked for two years interest only. His credit was below average. The land's loan to cost was 68%, ample liquidity into the deal, but the customer had marginal liquidity and reserves. Note the difference in his pricing. Please place handouts 3, 4, and 5 side by side in front of you. We will dissect each transaction to give you the perspective of what the lender sees when he looks at each deal. This could be very beneficial to you. Please follow closely. Transaction 1 that was seen on handout number 3 was basically an equity takeout of an owner-occupied office building to fund the construction of another office building that he intended to lease up upon completion. Let's look at this from the perspective of what the borrower sees in terms of risk to the lender. The borrower is saying, hey, I've got $300,000 in equity in this building that I operate in. It's my primary business and there's no way I would let it fail. And the loan to value on this transaction is 79%, which is really good. What the lender sees is construction being funded with his money that's not being controlled by the bank's construction loan process. In this example, the borrower has 100% control of when he gets the money and what he does with the money, including, but not limited to, doing exactly what he said he wouldn't do. What if he decides to go out and buy a $100,000 Porsche and buys the property and plans to build on it later? That property and that car are not going to produce any income to repay that loan. And what happens if his business starts to slow down? These are things that you need to consider. That's how your lender is thinking. Another thing to consider in this particular type of transaction, what if the building gets completed, has cost overruns, the borrower has to use up his additional monies, and it's putting him at overall financial risk, especially if the building doesn't lease up in the time frame he anticipated. There's plenty of risk here. But overall, it's a very good transaction because the borrower has plenty to lose. The borrower has a good credit score. The borrower has experience. Obviously, he's been in that building a long time and operated his business for a long time. And he's got ample cash reserves to support the credit as long as nothing gets too sideways. So this overall is a very good transaction, and that's reflected in the rates that you see that he's offered. 4.75%, a quarter point on the on the upfront, and that's why his annual percentage rate is 7.4% on this transaction. This is a very solid deal. Please take a look at your handout number four, which is the second loan transaction. This loan is very similar to the first in many ways, but there's one key difference. The borrower actually is asking for 75% of the loan to cost because he needs the bank's money and his money to build out the project. Therefore, the bank said we'll loan you 75% of the total construction cost plus 75% of the cost of the land to complete your project. As a result, this borrower had to bring $52,500 in cash to the table as his equity contribution for the transaction. He can't use the equity in the building because it's not there yet. This building is going to be constructed. As a result, the bank decided to charge a one point higher interest rate and a full point on the loan origination fee. Don't view this as a punishment to the borrower. Let's look at this for what it really is. The bank is going to have to monitor all of the construction draws over the next 24 months. That means they're going to have to gauge an inspector to go out there. They're going to have to read the report. They're going to have to advance the draws. They're going to have to do everything. So it's going to be very labor intensive for the bank to do this. And it only makes sense that they're going to charge a little bit more interest and in fees to get the job done. The good news is this is not a bad thing for the borrower. At the end of the day, because he brought an additional $50,000 plus to the table as an equity contribution, he'll pay lower interest over the life of the loan, which as a result will lower his total cost of the credit and drop his annual percentage rate to nearly a full point lower than the previous borrowers. So this is a, also a very strong deal, and I love the fact that this borrower is able to bring $52,500 in cash, and that's why it's reflected in his low annual percentage rate. Please go to handout number five again, which is actually the third loan transaction. This transaction is exactly like the previous one with two different variables. 
the borrower had less than average credit and well below average liquidity and reserves. As a result, in order to do the same transaction as the previous borrower, he had to bring a larger down payment to the table in the amount of $67,200, and he had to pay a two-point higher interest rate than the original one in the first transaction and a one-point higher rate than the borrower in the second transaction. He also had to pay a full point, but that went back to hit him in the long run because even though his interest fees were lowest of all the loans because he had the largest down payment, he had a higher APR because of the fees that he had to pay associated with this loan and the increased interest rate. As the interest rate rises, so does your cost of the transaction, even if you're borrowing less money. So, as you can see in this particular deal, this borrower was approved for the loan, will probably do okay with it, but it came at a very steep cost for him because his credit was bad and he didn't have liquidity. So it's not without its risk to the lender, and they took advantage of that and said, okay, we're going to have to charge prime plus two, and we're going to have to charge a full point on the origination fee. In conclusion, none of these deals was acceptable exceptionally bad or would have been a deal that I personally would have walked away from, especially if that's how I make my living. It's important to note that when you get into a situation that you learn from it. Each borrower should be able to look back and say, what could I have done differently to have positioned myself to get the most favorable pricing and to get the most favorable interest rate? So pay particular attention to what you can do and get as much of that done on the front side and present a solid argument to your lender. These things will help you ensure that you get the best rates possible, keep your costs down, and stay in business for years to come. Rates and yields expose the true costs of borrowing. The higher the perceived risk you are to the lender, the higher fees you'll have to pay, and also the higher rates you'll have to pay. The less liquidity and reserves you'll have after the transaction and the more down payment you'll have to provide to enter the transaction. Never accept a loan offer until you have crunched the numbers and know what it will cost you to complete the transaction. Anticipate that something will go wrong with the deal and be prepared. Know the facts before you sign. Don't hesitate to ask for lower fees within reason. You don't want to insult your lender. Make your case in terms of less risk, not higher profit margins for you at the end of the day. Ways to buy down a higher interest rate. We learned already that interest paid over the life of a loan is a major component of that annual percentage rate figure that determines the overall cost of your transaction. It makes sense to believe that the higher the interest rate, the more significant cost you will face as a borrower, and the more sense it makes to focus on how to get the best of an interest rate you don't like when your lender won't budge on it. We also know that the initial half of the loan incurs the greatest interest charges because the majority of the payment goes towards interest because the principal balance is the greatest. The key to buying your interest rate down when the lender won't budge is to pay extra principal on every payment. Make the most extra principal payments while your principal balance is highest to get the best effect. Never ever pay late fees or wait until the last minute to pay your payment. Interest never sleeps. Don't fall for the oldest trick in the book. How many times have you heard of borrowers buying rates down by paying a larger fee of some kind to the lender in exchange for that lower rate? One extra point on a $500,000 loan results in an additional cash lay up front of $5,000. By having the skills to do the APR cost analysis, like we already know how to do, you can see if this makes sense to pay the $5,000 up front in exchange for buying your interest rate down. Many borrowers prematurely jump at the lower rate without understanding its true cost to them. Never do that. The time value of money and opportunity cost. We know that time is money. Never step on a dollar to pick up a dime. The opportunity cost is the potential financial benefit lost or gained by selecting one alternative over another. When it comes to getting me to pony up additional cash for any deal, the lender had better have a pretty compelling case. I always think of what I could do if that extra money was in my pocket versus the lender's over the same time period in question.